Thank you, I'm Mr. Lanier, and welcome back to Mr. Lanier's Math Extravaganza. If you've noticed, again, we're without the technology as we jump into our next unit, which is variables and patterns. And today we're going to take a look at data tables and graphs as we really start to dig deep into algebra, again, starting with uh, these graphs up here. So, if you have your CMP3 book at home, you can open up to page 20. We're going to take a look at a couple of the homework problems today, uh, problems two and problem three. Uh, we're going to start with problem two, which is right up here on our front board. Uh, problem two is a two portion uh, question on here. It deals with some student work. This is really great. Uh, one of the best ways to learn is to kind of analyze student work or in your own classroom, analyze what your friend or your neighbor comes up with uh, inside your groups. It helps you kind of learn the math. So we're going to take a look here at uh, Jamil and uh, Ming and what they came up with. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, when Ming and Jamil, uh, Jamil studied growth in the population of their city, they found these data. It says population of uh, Okimos, uh, and that tells you the year, and it goes 1970, 1980, 1990, 1995, 2000, 2005, 2010. It says population in the 1000s. So when I see 20 there, that tells me it stands for? Go on, 20,000, 25,000, 30,000, so forth, all the way through to 50. So, in A, this is what Ming came up with. She decided to make herself a chart. The year on the bottom, the number of people on the top. I can see her interval, again, remember how much is in between. 20,000, 40,000, 60,000. She has a 20,000 interval between each one of her points uh, up there on the, what we call the Y axis. On the x-axis down here, she's listed the year. Side 1970, 80, 90, 2000, 2010. And then she's plotted her points where uh, each of these would fit. She said, the graph shows population growing faster in the period from 1995 to 2010 uh, than uh, earlier. Is Ming's claim accurate? Why or why not? So let's analyze her work here. She says that from the period from 1995, which is going to be right in between here, to, 20, to 2010, that the population is growing faster uh, than earlier. So let's look at earlier. I see, yeah, they're kind of growing a little bit. But when I look here, it's a stronger growth or a faster growth. And I'm not sure if it's hard for you guys to see with the being so zoomed out. But if you're looking in your books um, at home, take a look and you can see how it kind of shoots up. So we would know that uh, Ming's claim here is definitely accurate because from 1995 all the way to 2010 it almost looks like it doubles, nearly doubles uh, in the population from uh, 1995 uh, all the way to 2010. So I would say her claim is correct in this one and we're, we've backed it up with evidence from um, our uh, chart up here. Let's take a look at Jamil. Uh, they made a different graph and it was shown below. So again, I see what number of people on the side here, same as the bottom, uh, same as the y-axis up there. The year, which is the same on the x-axis. Same thing, population of Okimo, so they titled their graph, which is important. Um, their interval was 20,000 here. Uh, let's see, 1970, 80, 90, 95, 2000, 2005, 2010. Okay, so I see that they kind of made their bottom uh, portion here, and they charted or plotted out their graph. He says that the graph shows population growing at a steady rate. Is his claim accurate? Why or why not? Well, if I look at his graph here, it kind of looks like, yeah, it's kind of going at a steady rate. I would think that he might be correct here. But there's a key thing, and maybe you saw this when you guys are looking at your books here. If you notice, what's different about the bottom of his chart than Ming's chart up here? Exactly right. She goes by an interval of 10 each time. He changed his interval here from, instead of going 10 years, he then changed it to a five year interval, which can kind of like skew the data. Uh, we've talked a little bit about like misleading graphs and how like companies might use misleading graphs to show um, different data. Here's a perfect example. He changed the interval there on the bottom to make his chart look like there was a steady increase all the way throughout, which is not the case. If we look at an interval that stays consistent or steady, like 10 years every single time, you can see it's not a steady increase because, whoa, right there from 95 to 2010, it kind of shoots up. 
Whereas since he spaced this out by five years and changed the interval midway through, um, you can definitely see how um, that could be misleading. Now, if he made his chart 1970, 75, 80, 85, and kept the interval um, of five the entire time, that would be a different story. But since he changed the interval midway through his chart, it, uh, it gives us mixed results here. Um, so again, we took a look at two students' work, we took a look at what they thought, and then we kind of analyzed. Do we agree with the student? Do we disagree with the student? And then why? So much of the way that I asked you guys in class um, to kind of analyze your partner's work. Don't always just say, oh yeah, I agree with them, or oh, I'm right, you're wrong. Well, no. Why? Why do you believe that you're right? Or how can you prove that somebody's wrong? Using the mathematics behind it to do that. Let's take a look at another problem. Uh, and this one's going to have to deal a little bit with school. And let's pull this up and see if I can zoom in a little bit closer for you guys so that it's easier for you guys to see on the screen here. All right. All right. There we go. And we'll freeze it. All right. Perfect. And this is actually going to be the one that, of course, you guys are going to do at home. Even though the little sign up top doesn't say your turn, it's definitely going to be your turn. Uh, problem three. So the graph below shows the numbers of cans of juice purchased each hour from a school's vending machines in one day. On the x-axis of the graph, 7 means from the time 7 to 8, and so on. A. What might explain the high and low sale time period shown by the graph? B. Does it make sense to connect the points on this graph? Why or why not? Go ahead and pause this video, and we'll see what you come up with. Okay, when looking at this graph up here, again, our uh, y-axis says cans sold, so this is the number of cans that are sold. It says time of the day starting with 7 a.m., so this goes from 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., so it's a one-hour interval all the way through. And this tells you it's the juice vending machine sale, so it's very important that we have a title of the graph so that you know what do these numbers mean. Okay, one says what might explain the high and low sale time period shown by the graph here. As I look, not really too much going on at 7 a.m. Well, why not? Well, chances are there's probably not many students in the building at 7 a.m. Okay, 8 a.m. it kind of goes up to about 20, so maybe that's the morning when some students are coming in. Okay, 9 o'clock it kind of goes up to 80, so what could that be? You're right, maybe it's the breakfast. Uh, people that are coming in that are purchasing juice for breakfast. Then it dips down. At 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, it's really low. Why might it be low? Yeah, the students might be in class. If they're in class, obviously they can't go out to buy juice unless they're like ditching class or doing something they're not supposed to be. But hopefully nobody's doing that. Uh, then noon it starts to go up. At 1 o'clock it skyrockets up. And then at 2 o'clock it's pretty high. So what's happening here, do you think? Yeah, it could be the different students' lunch period. Now, uh, in our school here, we have everyone has the same lunch time uh, with our intermediate wing, but when you get into high school or sometimes in junior highs, they might stagger lunch periods where you might have one at 12, some might have one at 1, or someone might have one later in the day, closer to 2. Um, so you can see it definitely spikes up there, then it drops down again, students are back in the class, and then it kind of spikes back up at 5 o'clock. That's interesting. Why would it go back up at 5 o'clock? Um, at 3 and 4, we can assume that some of the students have left the building, they've gone for the day, they went home after a nice, I know, fun and great day in school. Uh, why would it spike back up? Good point. Maybe they're in a sport. Maybe there's a sporting event at school after school where they're able to stay after and they're buying juice, say, at like a 4.30 game or 5 o'clock game. People might be buying some of this juice um, during that time. And then again, game ends, end of the night. There's not really many sales at 6 and 7 o'clock um, there at night. So we kind of analyzed um, what, they, uh, what the graph shows here by using a little bit of our prior knowledge, a little inference in there, um, and what's on the graph. It says, does it make sense to connect the points on this graph? Why or why not? For this graph, yes. If I connected these points, it would kind of show the spikes um, or the rise and the fall in each one uh, of the sales. So if I were, say, working for a business, I could look at this and say, hey, we're going to need some extra help maybe at this time because, look, this is our peak time. This is when we're going to get a lot of business up here um, for this juice. Whereas I might say, you know what, early in the morning, or late at night, we're not going to need as many people or as much there because um, there's not as many people um, in there. 
So hopefully this made sense as you were working through. Um, within this investigation and in this book, we're going to be working a lot with data tables, graphs, um, scale factors in here, as well as a little bit of algebra. Thank you for tuning in to Miscellaneous Math Extravaganza. As always, we'll see you next time.